Okay, it's just one minute until we join um, our first Tarrant County Democratic Party virtual town hall meeting. Um, the voice in the sky, that's me. One minute until we Heather Buen. And I am the communications chair for Tarrant County Democratic Party. So I'm just going to give a little bit of logistics and make sure more uh, people can join into the town hall. Um, if you do have a question, a, a lot of people have pre-submitted questions beforehand. And so our moderator will be asking uh, Vance uh, some of those questions. But if you do have questions, please write them in the comments of the town hall and we'll try to get to them. I will submit those to the moderator. If um, we don't get to your questions, we're gonna make sure that everybody gets an answer to the questions. Um, so if you need to submit a question to us, uh, just send an email to info at tarrantdemocrats.org and we will answer it for you. Um, now I'm going to actually have our county chair give a few remarks. So thank you, voice in the sky, Heather Gwynn. But I want to give you greetings uh, from the Tarrant County Democratic Party. As you know, our office is currently closed uh, for physical contact because of COVID-19. But we are certainly not uh, being idle during this period. We are hard at work every day, online, being, doing virtual town halls through Zoom meetings to continue the work of the Tarrant County Democratic Party. You can still reach us by contacting the office at 817-335-8683, or you can continue emailing us at info at tarrantdemocrats.org. And so one of the most exciting things I want to uh, talk to you about right now is in the latest round of lawsuits, uh, we actually won one yesterday. Uh, all Texans are getting closer to voting by mail. If you have a health and safety concern about voting in person, you should be allowed to vote by mail. For those who are eligible to vote by mail, if you need an application, please vote mytexasvotes.com to have an application, a vote by mail application sent to you. A uh, district judge in Travis County yesterday ruled that uh, anyone who is uh, impacted by COVID-19 and feels that they would suffer health or disability by going to vote in person can vote by mail. While we won this battle, I expect Republicans to appeal that. And so more on that, but just know that your Tarrant County Democratic Party has been heavily involved in uh, following the course of this lawsuit. So we're very happy about yesterday's uh, ruling, but no Republicans in their uh, re unrelenting attempt to do voter suppression will try to stop that. Uh, we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you again before I turn this over, um, working with your town county Democratic Party is more important than ever. And we know that while we aren't going out and knocking on door to door, we continue to make phone calls, we continue to do digital organizing. So any funds that we raise locally are spent right here in Tarrant County to help elect Democrats up and down the battle. So please, please, please consider donating to TarrantDemocrats.org and make it a recurring donation. We have an incredible roster of candidates that we will be working to elect in November. And because of COVID-19, we have had to cancel all of our in-person events to raise dollars. So we're relying on you to help with an online donation. Now, having said all that, this is our first uh, virtual town hall to talk about issues that impact Democrats, not only around Tarrant County, but across the state and the nation. And so I am truly pleased and happy to introduce uh, the moderator for today's first virtual town hall. And if you've been keeping up with things, Candace Quarles is an extraordinary woman on the go. 
Candace serves as the DeSoto City Council member, but and and she has proposed landmark le uh, legislation there in DeSoto with paid leave uh, for families, which is an incredible right that families should have. But she also works for the Working Families Party. She's an organizing director, and I had an opportunity to visit with members of this extraordinary group. They are working on issues that impact all of ours, issues like um, health care, issues like immigrant rights, issues like voter suppression. And so the work that she does, not only for DeSoto, but for us nationally, with the Working Families Party should be um, celebrated and saluted. So the Working Families Party has endorsed our Democratic candidate uh, for our Sheriff of Tarrant County, Vance Keys. And so, Candace, thank you for agreeing to come on today to help moderate this. And please, uh, to our audience that's viewing this now, please welcome an up-and-coming leader, Candace Quarles. introduction um it has definitely been great working with you um and all your leadership on the tarrant county democratic party we all know how important tarrant county is um across the state um it is the bellwether county of um how well we're going to do in november so uh under your leadership i know um big things are are, are on, on the horizon and um, any way we can support you, and especially just always you being a supporter um, as well. But yes, um, like she said, I'm a, I work for the uh, Working Families Party. Um, so we are a multiracial um, party led for the people, by the people. And we believe that government should work for the many and not for the few. Um, we believe in uh, Medicare for all. We believe in, um, let's see, legalization of marijuana. We believe that um, uh, your one job should be enough and the job should be able to pay a living wage. And um, we believe that uh, voting rights Definitely, uh, we should give more access for people to vote and, and, and restricting of access is definitely not something that we should be a part of. So um, Vance Keys is one of our candidates that um, seeks our endorsement, um, committee of, can of it, progressive leaders and community activists came together heard from him and said, wow, he really is uh, someone that aligns with the values of the Working Families Party. And um, they endorsed him for the, the March primary. So Vance, it is good to see you. How are you doing? Outstanding, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening. Yeah, and how are you doing COVID-19 times? How, how are you still quarantining these days? I uh, still have to work. Um, actually, burning time to be here right now. I still have to work, um, but I'm good. My family's good. Um, my friends are good for the most part. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Good, good, good. So um, tell me a little bit about you say you still have to work. So so tell me what do you do and currently what you're working on right now? I'm a police officer, a uh, police captain for the city of Fort Worth. I'm over, I'm over SWAT, uh, Mounted, and our SEER, which is our special events. Um, everything's really been ramped down and slowed down now. So it's really about just trying to contain um the virus internally and externally you know we have the um stay in um place right the um you know the shelter in place rather um in dallas county as well as in tarrant county and um what that really is designed to do is designed to keep people safe i know people got their stimulus checks you're going to be out shopping they're going to be going places but um i just want people to be safe go out and get what you need um and after you get what you need, please return home. Um, I was driving the other day. I was off duty and I saw just a bunch of kids, probably 10, 15 kids unsupervised in proximity. And um, it was clear that they weren't from the same household. And so mm -hmm. if you're not watching your kids, you're not supervising your kids, they're coming into contact with people. Um, they're, mm -hmm. young, they're probably going to be resilient, but there are older populations. And so we just have to be mindful as a community of keeping each other safe. 
Got it. Got it. Well, I, uh, just looking, you know, during these COVID times, we get to see people's houses a little bit more than we normally do. So I see you have a wall full of, uh, it looks like degrees there. So tell you a little bit about your background and how did you get to um, being a Fort Worth police officer? Okay. So uh, I've said this many times, but I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina, served five years in the Marine Corps, uh, separated from the Marine Corps. I was doing telecommunications uh, in Dallas and I um, quit my job, had some money saved up. And decided, you know what? I'm going to be a police officer. I thought about doing it when I was much younger. Um, and so I decided to um, follow that call and follow that, you know, that ambition. And I've been here ever since. Uh, 20 years in law enforcement this year. Um, served in multiple capacities detective, police officer, patrol supervisor, narcotics, internal affairs, um, crime response team, uh, over training, backgrounds, communications. I've had a really uh, phenomenal career. I was. Um, a graduate of the FBI National Academy, uh, Leadership Command College out of Texas, uh, the Police Executive Research Forum out of Boston. Um, again, I'm currently a captain. I have a um, bachelor's and a master's degree in criminal justice, a master's degree in public administration, a master's degree in criminology, and a doctorate in conflict analysis and resolution. What organization, I don't know, what college or universities did you get those from? I'm sorry, I, you cut out or I cut out. Your college and universities that you got those from? You said. Sound like two bachelor, two master's degrees. You have a bachelor's, three master's degree, um, three master's degrees, a doctorate, and um, two academic certificates. One in African American studies, one in education. And right, what organ, what university did you get? Uh, wow, well, uh, Texas A&M University of Commerce, Nova Southeastern University, Mountain State University, University of Houston. Um, I'm going to forget one. University of Virginia, uh, Sam Houston State, and Tarleton State. Got it. Okay. Well, good. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, one, starting off with, uh, so why are you running for sheriff? Tell I'm, us about that journey. Okay. I'm running for sheriff. Ideally, I don't think anybody as a child decides that they want to run for sheriff. It's a very political uh, you know, endeavor. Um, but working in law enforcement 20 years, I realized mm -hmm. I'm not going to have the impact that I want to have as a middle manager in my current agency. I don't get to say that you know the buck stops here. And ultimately, I saw things um, that I thought needed change that I still think um, needs to be changed. And I don't think, well, I know that the current administration for Tarrant County is not doing, I've spent 20 years in law enforcement. So it's not like it's some great cushion, right? The sheriff's job would be great, a great opportunity for me. I think a great opportunity for um, the county as well, but it isn't gonna like, if I leave at 20 years, I don't get a retirement right off. I've got to wait at least five years. But I want to be the sheriff because I, there's just so much growth for opportunity. And we can talk about that now. We can segue into it if you'd like or if you've got a follow up question uh, to what I'm saying. OK, yeah. So I want to I remind really people to that. that you can put comments in the chat and then we're going to answer some of those comments in the end. So if you want to go ahead and put some comments in the chat, we can see those. Um, so. One of the biggest problems with law enforcement today, uh, particularly uh, in, in um, Ontario County, um, is lack of community engagement. So um, tell me, how do you think that the sheriff's office has a role in changing that? And then how would you work to build uh, some of that broken trust that's happened over in Tarrant County, Fort Worth and uh, some of the other cities? So I think law enforcement generally does a good job. And I said generally, um, there's high profile incidents where we just we fall short. And then there's day to day, um, there's day to day policies and practices where we fall short. And one of those um, practices, I believe, is transparency. There is no transparency in the Tarrant County Sheriff's Department so far as uh, what's going on internally with the staff, um, what's going on with the full involvement with the citizens of Tarrant County. And I start by doing that. I know I can't reach two million plus residents, right? So I start doing that through social media. Uh, through a web well, here, ideally you gender demographic and you don't and who's in jail of the sheriff's department in charge of what um another thing um i want to do i want to give people uh the right to have access into the policies that are made into you know tarrant county i mean really and when i say 
uh, citizen oversight, that may scare people. That may make people think, oh my God, this is bad. No, we absolutely work for the citizens. And so I don't know the job where I can go to work and not report to a supervisor or not report to a boss. Even if that, that's a collective, it needs to be um, that level of involvement. There's a lot of things I see one question, what am I gonna do when I win a sheriff? Well, some things I wanna do, I wanna create that transparency. I wanna give the people though, the people that work within Tarrant County a voice. I don't want it to be, you know, you're late today and you get five days off and this other person's late and they get nothing. I want a disciplinary matrix in place that is, um, that's, that, that's, that's established uh, with input from the people that work at Tarrant County because I want that transparency in, in, internally and externally. So there's a lot of things I want to do. I mean, I, I'm just I'm bubbling with ideas. I'm not going to talk all day. I know we don't have all day, but I can talk all day. Well, good. No, no, definitely. We, um, uh, I think, you know, with law enforcement, there is so many, uh, you know, schools of thought on how you approach it. And okay. I think it has a lot to do with particularly where you grew up, your background, and then how did you get to this point? But then also, um, you know, you've seen it firsthand. How do we change some of these things? I think uh, a lot of families are um, at home. We're being more family time than we're used to right now. And um, especially in these this, these COVID times, uh, I want to talk to you about your approach to conflict resolution when it comes to uh um, specifically family time. So we're all at home. Uh, I'm an elected official as well. We've seen an uptick in domestic abuse, um, child abuse. Um, maybe it's due to like family stress, financial stress, emotional, you know, lack of we're not in school, we're all in the same household all day long. Based on your expertise, what kind of conflict resolution tips can you offer families during this stressful time? Okay. So you're right. We're at unprecedented times. We have people that aren't working. We have college kids that are at home, high school kids or middle school. Everybody's and no matter how big your house is, where you live, we're in conditions to where we're around each other more. And the more you're around somebody, that's more opportunity for conflict. That's how you manage your conflict. So ideally, we talk about social distances, you know, in the public, that six feet, you want to wear your mask. Well, ideally, if you're at home, you need that distance, right? You need that social store. Whether somebody exercise room, all right. So ideally, you want to talk about things, you want to work things out, but that's not always possible, especially with financial stressors, right? Um, with just the stressors of being around these people that you don't normally see, you might get like you might be compressed by going to work. So ideally, you just, you just want to give people space and time where possible, right? And respect people's um, rights to privacy. I mean, I know we're all here, right? But in my house, so my daughter's home from college. I'm not used to having, you know, a, a, a young teenager running around my house. I mean, she's been gone for almost, you know, a couple of semesters now. So at, it's a readjustment. But we have to, I have to give her space and know that even though she's an adult and I'm an adult and she's my child, I have to give her space, right? I can't be on her about, mm -hmm. you know, it's just 24 7, this, this, that, and other. Just give people space. And this thing will clear up, right? This pandemic is not going to last forever. Right, right. Well, now I want to uh, kind of switch to um, speaking about your child, about um, just in general, when we're talking about our youth, particularly, um, this is a question about juvenile youth offenders and how they're processed in Tarrant County. Um, there are different schools of thought on how we handle them. There are different uh, ways in, in, in different cities. Um, how um, our juvenile offenders are treated um, in more of a reform type of approach or um, we treat them like, you know, the adults that they are, whether they're 18 or 45. Um, talk to me about um, what kind of reforms would you implement when it comes to the juvenile system, particularly our young offenders? Okay, so actually Texas has a really good um, system when it comes to handling juvenile offenders. Uh, once you're 17, you're classified as an adult and you will go to Tarrant County or some form of jail. If you come out of office, juvenile, you go to the. The only time you're really coming to contact, other than that initial arrest process, uh, with the Tarrant County jail would be if you were a juvenile that was classified as an adult by a judge. And then at that point, you have sires, you know, the real, um, at this point, because Tarrant County has a great, not just Tarrant County, Texas has a great system for separating 
juvenile offenders from adult offenders. Did I answer your question or? I'm sorry, it's just a little bit of a lag. So I'm trying to catch your last word. Um, when you said um, the sounds like you said you're OK with the separation of the systems between juvenile offenders and the adult offenders. What kind of reforms would you put in place for those juvenile offenders? Because um, my question would be around these are our children. They're sometimes brought up in systems and environments where the choices that they make um, or lack of choices that they had leads to some of them being in front of you. What can we put in place or what are we doing um, so that they aren't eventually an uh, adult offender? What can we do as community? And then what can you do on the law enforcement side that doesn't label the 15 year old that made a mistake one time in his life for the rest of his life to be defined by his worst mistake? So I'm all about second chances, second opportunities. I believe that we should have a diversionary um, system in place. And I think that there is one in many cities to where they don't immediately go to jail if it's their first offense and it's not violent. They're given all types of breaks. Um, I would like to see um, law enforcement, what's the law enforcement, the sheriff's office specifically partnering uh, with youth groups and with community outreach groups. I'm not saying that they, that, that, that they don't do that. I'm just unaware. The power is limited, but the power does have a purpose, purpose to police athletic league. It, it, it gives young people mentors and it gives them opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have. I came from a um, very um, humble background, uh, very impoverished. No, I came from the country. And so you weren't going to get into a lot anyway, because, you know, you run around playing in the creek and jumping over rattlesnakes. It's just not a lot to do. So I wasn't really at risk for doing anything criminal uh, when I was young in the backwoods of North Carolina. But in the urban area, it's so different. And so I think you have to reach those youth and those juveniles prior to them getting in trouble. When they get in trouble, you definitely want to, you know, if it's not just that hands where they have to do time, you definitely want to um, um, try to find some alternative other than confinement because confinement just, that's a short-term fix to a long-term problem, right? I mean, you're always going to have um, social economic disadvantages. You're going to have um, people that feel like they're throwaways. There's always going to be that. But I think as far as law enforcement, we have to be seen um, in a more compassionate role. And that means establishing relationships prior to that person getting in trouble or having compassion when that person does get in trouble if there's discretion. Got it. Thank you for that. And um, so my next question for you um, is about um, 287G. What's your stance on that? Um, and then uh, explain 287G for, 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 for those watching that might not understand what, what that policy or concept is. Okay, I, so there is on my share of 287 uh, to be a party to. Now, the agreement can be terminated at any time by ICE or by the sheriff. It takes the county commissioner's approval um, to fund it, right? But there's a un there's an unknown cost in terms of uh, uh, what it's doing to families here in Tarrant County, what it's doing to our community, and also financially. So, when I'm elected as sheriff, day one, 287G is out the window, is gone because it doesn't have um, an appreciable impact on public safety, and it simply divides communities. We've got um, a very significant uh, portion of our community that's Latino, right? And if they witness an offense, if they're a victim of an offense, I don't want anybody feeling uncomfortable like they can't call the police because we're going to check their immigration status. I know, you know, SB4, um, our sheriff back in, I think, 2017, uh, you know, he was quoted in the paper saying he was going to create this this great big net to nab people. And so I don't know what the deputies are doing on the streets, but I would assume if he is a partner uh, with ICE in 287G, who's said that those deputies aren't out there asking people their immigration status under SB4. And I just don't think that's the right thing to do. I think you deal with the offense. Um, if it's DWI, if it's criminal trespass, you deal with the offense, but you don't label people and you certainly don't separate people from families unnecessarily. And I think that's what 287G does. On top of that, you have these 12 deputies, the travel's not paid, the transportation's not paid when they go down to uh, Flat C and Glen Clover, Georgia or wherever they're going to get training. Who's paying for that, right? We're we're paying the taxpayers. Make it short and simple. It's a done deal when I'm sheriff. You no, know, ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
is is done. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so my next question is about um, I think you've held some, mm -hmm. some workshops, uh, classes about know your rights uh, for people in the community. So can you give some tips and insights for Texans specifically about um, their responsibilities, their rights during an arrest or in a stop? OK, so on a traffic stop and I preach this, you know, I talk to youth over probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years on what to do when I stopped by the police and some adults too. It's a two-way process. So ideally, the officer doesn't know who you are and you just know that person is a police officer. And there's already this, um, this apprehension, this anxiety, probably on both sides, but you want clear communication. So if you pulled over in your vehicle, um, it's not so much about being respectful. You should be respectful as shit the officer, but it's about clear communication. So ideally you want to turn your music down. If you've got dark tinted windows or you're not, you want to roll those windows down. You want to have clear communication. You don't want to do anything without informing the officer uh, that you're going to do it. So don't reach in your backpack for a brush or don't reach in your glove compartment uh, to retrieve insurance. When I'm stopped and I do get stopped by police, not quite often, but I do get stopped. When I'm stopped, I tell the officer exactly what it is that I'm going to do prior to doing it. If they ask for registration, not registration, sorry, um, insurance, sir, my insurance is in my center council. I'm going to reach inside my center council and retrieve that insurance. It's just, it's, it's just clear communications. I pulled a kid over some years ago, and this is kind of funny, but not really. His music was so loud that he had like these earplugs in his ear. I can't have communication with that person. Turn your music down. You know, I want you to know what I'm telling you, and, and, and I want you um, to um, leave that traffic stop safe, as I want to leave that traffic stop safe, but generally know your rights, right? The biggest impediment to justice for anybody is ignorance. Know your rights. It's all on uh, the internet these days. www.texasstatutes.com. And, and you can look up uh, the penal code, the code of criminal procedure. I meet so many people that want to tell me their rights and they have no clue. Learn your rights. Know your rights. Uh, when it comes to dealing with law enforcement, it's not... Um, it, it 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 behooves you to know your rights, right? Because cops aren't going to tell you your rights and they're not required to. They they just aren't. It's a cat and mouse game of can I find you doing something illegal? And ideally, you shouldn't be doing something illegal. But whether you're doing something illegal or not, you still have constitutional rights. Bottom line in the story. And nobody's rights should be violated. I'm a firm believer in due process. If you're doing dirt, you're doing wrong, I'll get you, but I'll get you the right way. I'm not going to violate your rights and put a stain on my character or my integrity to get at you. It, 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 but some people will take advantage of your ignorance, too. So ideally do the right thing. And then talk to me about, um, you know, some of the you can't talk about specific issues, but what is the responsibility of law enforcement um, when it comes to. You, we've all seen these traffic traffic stops go bad or, you know, one wrong or you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, an excited, excitable moment turns into something fatal. And, um, you know, as, as people who are not in touch with statutes every day, but we expect that our law enforcement officers are in touch with those statutes and, and you know, have them close to their vest when they're making decisions. Uh, talk to us about what you plan to do um, in your capacity as sheriff, if that is your capacity, to um, have people. Um, how is this going to be looked at? How can we have a better outcome in some of these traffic stops where, you know, we only we see all the bad ones. Um, but then that's still enough. That's still enough <laughs> where it's a cause for concern about uh, protocol, practice, policy. Um, and then some of the on the things on the the, the citizen side of, of okay everything could possibly be because I just didn't tell you I was getting my gun I didn't I didn't reach for my insurance card properly and somehow that's okay with it ending in a fatal incident so talk to us a little bit about that and what you plan to do around that so it's never okay um and it was a big lag I caught a lot of what you were saying and maybe my end I have like a horrible signal most days. But I will say this. Um, what I want to do about that. So first, what you do is you have that transparency piece, right? You tell the public what it is that you're going to do. And you tell the officers 
what it is you expect of them. And you make that transparent to both the officers and to the community. Right. That's just that's what it is. And then when there's a failure or when there's noncompliance, I'm not saying you fire everybody. I'm not saying you go after everybody criminally, but you hold people accountable and you don't cover things up. And you say on this state at this time, we did this. Our policy states this. This is where we failed. And this is how we correct this. Right. That's what you have to do, because we're going to make mistakes in law enforcement. And when you make mistakes, you have to own those mistakes. We're going to mess up in law enforcement. When we mess up. You have to own it. So ideally, I want transparent policy for public consumption. And then when that policy is not followed, there's accountability. I mean, that, that's the same, because the biggest thing is you're never going to stop um, all air uses of force. But what you can do is you can hold people accountable for when they make them. That's that's you, you just transparency, compassion, accountability. That's my platform. I do want to talk. Um, I know we're talking about police and that's very important. That That's like that's my 20 year mantra. Right. Law enforcement, police. And I do want to talk though about um, the jail and that population, because I believe a lot of times uh, that doesn't get the attention that's needed. From the inmate side, or from the detention officers that work in that jail. Right. So transparency. We, and we, we just talked about what what is Vance Key is going to do. They make the sheriff's department more transparent. COVID-19. Uh, last week, two inmates tested positive for COVID-19. And it was, you know, it was put out to the media. Um, but what wasn't put out was that one of those inmates was a trustee who was in contact with about 15 inmates who were trustees. And what's a trustee mean? Contact. Those people were... and they weren't quarantined and that's the problem because cd the cdc provides guidelines almost like an sop mm -hmm. for detention centers and jails and so if you don't know what to do you get guidance from other people mm -hmm. and so part of that transparency piece is yes we did this the cdc has this policy we didn't follow this policy and now we have this but ideally you want to have that transparency you want to let people know what you're doing and why you're doing it so now you know they're not tracking um, who's been in contact with infected people at Tarrant County. And that's a problem because that's not transparent, right? And so those are the types of things, those are the types of things I'm talking about. I would listen to my constituents. That's the voters, that's other law enforcement, that's the detention officers, right? That's the uh, confined population. You have to have those relationships. The sheriff wears many, many hats. Um, an internal source reported to me that they're actually taking temperatures with oral thermometers and they reject mm -hmm. the plastic piece and they're not changing gloves and they're not decontaminating the apparatus. And the problem I have with that, yes, you can put a little thing in my mouth and take my temperature, but I'm still breathing through my nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's just not right. Mm -hmm. and, and I heard that. What are the other, um, what is the recommended protocol for, is that the head thermometers or kind of what is, there's ear thermometers, there's forehead thermometers, um, a, a ear thermometer and a forehead thermometer, unless you're sweating or whatever, is not going to expose somebody to a bodily fluid. But if I put that thing mm -hmm. in your mouth and you're breathing, you know, you're breathing through your nose, you could actually excel some droplets and contaminate someone. And furthermore, you're not following the six feet protocol. It's mm -hmm. I mean, so there's a lot of things that are going on that aren't right. But do you see the sheriff saying, this is what we're doing? And this is what happened? No, that's not responsible. And that's not mm -hmm. transparent, right? Those detention officers, those, those, those deputies, they have a right to be safe in their working environment, as do the confined population per CDC protocol. If they come into contact with an affected person, whether they exhibit symptoms or not, you quarantine that person for 14 days and are monitored twice a day. We owe that to the people that work in Tarrant County. We owe that to the people that are confined in Tarrant County. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is about PPE. Do you know if they, what's the protocol? Do they have proper PPE, um, particularly the people that are handling public population in the jails? So, no. So, so let me address that really quick. I want to get back to the food handlers, though, but the, the, the kitchen 
in Tarrant County, it shut down because food handlers were contaminated. So how are we feeding these confined people, this confined population? Have you seen the sheriff speak to that? I don't think you will. But to, to get back to the personal um, protection equipment, no. On, I think, the 23rd, one of the chief deputies issued a memo saying we will not issue you any masks. The chief of confinement mm -hmm. sent that out to the people. We're not going to give you masks. So what does that say to your employees? If you tell them you're not going to now, it was since rescinded and, you know, changed. And now they're giving masks. No homemade masks are allowed. But initially, no, we're not giving you masks. And that that is accurate as of as far as, you know, a, couple, a day no, ago. No, no, well, it's since been rescinded, but it's, it's accurate that one of the chief administrators sent the directive out and said you're not. And that's very accurate. You know, now, yeah, it's since been changed. Um, but they can't get them from medical. It, it, the whole system needs to be revamped. There are people in power, there are people in place that have probably been there a little bit too long. And these and not that's not based either on some logic, some solid information I'm hearing from people that are better informed than me, right? That's not just the right thing to do because it's compassionate. What is not research driven? So if I make a change or, or, or if I make a decision, it's going to be for the betterment of Tarrant County, not to get people sick. Uh, I spoke about it on a previous video. There are misdemeanors. And we're paying five people. That's $21,000 plus dollars a month. Right. Why are we paying that? If they can't afford fines, so what? What's the right thing to do? To keep somebody in jail when they're not sentenced for a misdemeanor or to release that person if they're exposing officers and they're exposing inmates and themselves are being exposed to COVID-19 and is in the jail. In Tarrant County for a great while, they said, no, it's not here. It's not in jail. It's only a matter of time before COVID-19 affects the jail population. There's too much movement. There's simply too much movement. And so do I think this sheriff's done everything in his power to limit uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 in the jail? No, I don't. Do I think this sheriff's done everything in his power to represent and honor and make good on the promises that he made to the people of Tarrant County? No, I don't. And I don't say that from some moralistic elevated position. I say that from simply looking at what he's doing, looking at what he's saying, looking at what he's done and looking at what other people are doing across the nation in service of their counties in their communities. Until recently, he said it's business as usual. We have people sheltered in place. We have universities that are shut down. We have states that have closed their borders. And this sheriff is saying that it's business as usual? What is he thinking? Mm -hmm. Is he thinking? It's an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is an issue. You know, there are people, I read an article there, for instance, they're called super utilizers. There are people that consume a lot of criminal justice resources and they consume those resources because either they're criminally, um, I don't want to say criminally, and say either they're mental health consumers or they're substance abusers. Divert those people. They're a drain on the system. They don't benefit from being confined. The taxpayers don't benefit. The families don't. Nobody benefits from it other than mm -hmm. private corporations that make money off the taxpayers and the backs of people that are in jail. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And then in some of the cities, um, I know they're pushing for um, the release of um, low level nonviolent offenders, especially during COVID-19. Um, but outside of COVID-19, what is your stance on how we should um, how would you handle low level nonviolent offenders? Um, given your experience as a law enforcement officer, but also um given your future experience or future uh, position you're seeking as uh, the sheriff, the sheriff for Tarrant County well, and how we handle the jail population. So low level offenders have no long term place in Tarrant County. They are simply there to facilitate due process. Right. We take them to Tarrant County. We take them to jail and they're there, but they shouldn't be in jail. I don't want to but if it costs the taxpayer the money. It overworks your detention. There, you shouldn't be warehoused. I mean, we don't warehouse nonviolent people. I saw a question 
What am I going to do to improve the morale for TCO officers uh, for Tarrant County? And lots of ways. I want to the violations that impact them, right? So there's equity in the system and there's not abusive supervisors. Two, I think there should be a uniform committee. Um, I talked to some employees and one of the complaints, and it's such a petty complaint because it's such a petty practice to have, there's not good airflow in the jail. And they simply wanted the modified uniform so they could be more comfortable as they're working in the jail, a polo shirt. And that was denied because somebody thought that it wasn't professional. That is mm -hmm. absolutely ridiculous. You take care of your people. You take care of your employees. I heard that the um, this is probably gonna upset some people, but I hear that the um, the the, the, the food services is not really utilized by the staff, yet they're charged for it. If it's not used, bomb, put that money back in their pockets. If there's a uniform um contract, I'd rather you put that money in the pockets of the employee and that employee determine how they're gonna spend that three hundred dollars mm -hmm. instead of sending that money to a vendor and letting that vendor make money off the backs of the deputies and uh, detention officers. So mm. that's what I want to do for the employees. I know I can't do everything all at once, but the things I say I want to do, the things that I can do on day one, I will do on day one. And then I think that speaks to um, some of the issues and the complaints we've heard about with the morale um, in the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office with the prison employees. What would you do to improve that morale? Well, I'll tell you uh, what the sheriff has to do the sheriff has to be available to go to D.C. He's available to go to any other place he wants to go. He has to be available to the staff. And he has to be able to have a meeting with the staff that's separate from command staff. You can't have a meeting with somebody's supervisors and ask that person what's going on because chances are that person might not want to tell you what's going on with them. So ideally, you want to meet with each of your employees, each category, whether it's detention officers, whether it's deputies, whether it's supervisors, whether it's commanders. You want to meet with them collectively, but also separately. Get the temperature for what's going on in your agency. Talk to people. Mm -hmm. If they have good policies, then you implement them. You're not the smartest person. I don't care who you are, what degree you have, what it nobody. So if the sheriff's doing things, if he's making decisions nilly willy, or if he's um dependent on a core group of people to make those decisions for him, he's wrong. Get out there, get involved with your people. Find out what they need. I want to win this election. But if I don't win this election, Bill Wayborn needs to hear this loud and clearly. Your people are suffering and they're suffering because you're inattentive. They're suffering because you're not listening. They're suffering because you haven't taken the time to find out what they need to do their jobs. And I can tell mm -hmm. you, a happy employee may not be a productive employee, but they're going to cost you less drama. They're going to cost you mm -hmm. less trouble, right? I mean, you don't want an institutional terrorist. You don't want people they're trying to burn it down or people simply they're collecting a check. You want people that know you care about them. And so mm -hmm. my my message message to Bill Waymore is do your job, represent everybody, but also represent your employees because they work for you and they work for the county and they deserve it. Got it. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And then I think uh, we just had another question um, about the diversity of those employees in the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office, the prison employees. How do you plan uh, what's your plan to diversify some of the the team members in that particular staff group? You cut out. I got team members. Uh, diversity in the prison employees, Tarrant County Sheriff's Office. You got that diversity? It's funny you mentioned that months ago, and I asked this person uh, what his racial and gender demographics were, and he could not tell me. And I don't think it's been reported to this day, but you want a county that is reflective of your community, right? You want blacks, you want whites, you want females, you want Latinos, you want people that reflect the community. You have to have that because again, we're made greater by our diversity. We're made greater by our differences. Um, I would argue that Tarrant County is probably 90% all white male command staff, mm -hmm. but that doesn't reflect, the, I may be, it may be higher, I don't know. Now, you have to have that representation, but you have to have diversity, too. And so but that goes back to what do I do for employees? It's not what I do for employees. It's what we do for employees. So you want a system in place where ideally the sheriff or nobody else controls who gets promoted unless you're exempt positions and they're appointed through the process. It should be transparent. You take a test. 
outside experts come in and evaluate you. And there's no finagling or haggling or manipulating the system. So people know they have a fair opportunity for advancement. I want to change that. I want to change what they promote in Tarrant County. I want to be transparent and independent, really, of what the sheriff does. Not the good old boy system. I want to professionalize the sheriff's department. It may sound crazy, but that's what I want to do. I don't want to policeify. I don't want to policeify. I want to professionalize. Professionalize it. And I think Bill Wayborn has missed the awesome opportunity. You know, I've been in law enforcement 20 years. People were excited when he took over. They thought there was going to be this great amount of change. Maybe for a little bit there was, but I think he's fell short. And again, it's not a beat up on Sheriff Bill Lee Wayborn. Like it is. I don't do things. That I'll say I'm. I'm sorry, it's a little bit of lag of when you talk. Can you hear me? I couldn't hear you. No, I couldn't. Okay. Well, I have uh, one quick question. Um, someone wrote, what was the name of the website for the Know Your Rights? And then I have one other one. Okay. So this, all right. So I'll tell you this. Um, knowing your rights is a very, not a complicated process, but I can come tell you how you should behave when you interact with the police in Texas and specifically to Fort Worth. And I can tell you what you shouldn't do ideally, but knowing your rights is a very long process. It's not, you have to know the constitution. You have to know what your local ordinance are. You have to know your state law. So it's not like it's a magic, you know, one shot, but a good start is www.texasstatutes. It's the code of criminal procedure. The penal code simply tells you what the offense is and what punishment you'll receive. The code of criminal procedure tells you how law enforcement basically the rights to privileges, how we are to respond uh, when dealing with the public. Ideally, though, your local agency has a general orders or a policy manual that's placed online so you can further delve into it and see things that maybe the state allows, but that that local agency specifically prohibits. And so knowing your rights is a matter of knowing your local ordinances, knowing, you know, um, who's in command of your um, city, knowing how to complain on an officer, knowing how to commit an officer is a lot to it. What I'm going to do since that was asked for. When this is over, I'm going to get on my work on making that information available. So I'll try to condense it to what basically you can and can't do. And I think it'll make it better for you know citizens and police officers, too. Just so there's an understanding of, yes, you have to do this. Yes, I can make you do this. No, I can't. There's an old school thing in law enforcement. Ask, tell, make. Right. ATM is what we call it. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to make you. if. I have that legal right. And I don't like doing that. That's necessary sometimes, but ideally, I want to know the process and how you handle your situation. I don't want to be asked to make. I want to have a conversation if time allows. Hmm. But but I will put that information on my website. But there is the www.texas statutes that they can go and see the, every law in Texas, mm -hmm. if they live in Texas. Got it. Okay. And then uh, we had a question about what is your agenda for minority communities? And then what's your agenda for un the undocumented? So people? this is going to sound crazy, right? But I see somebody posted Democrat, AKA the evil party. Things kind of funny. Um, ideally, I don't have a special agenda for the minority community. And I don't have a special agenda for the undocumented community. What I want to do is I want to treat people fair and And by population is mostly black and Latino, right? So mm -hmm. all I gotta do is do my job as a sheriff, faithfully uphold my oath, and everybody's gonna benefit. I because I'm doing anything special. Only given or given before, I'm giving ability that they weren't given. Honest. Okay, well, we're gonna. Uh, so we're gonna. Uh, you are running for office. You're running for sheriff. How can we support you if we want to see you in office in November? website okay. uh, how can we donate so, um give money and then what's your plan to win 
okay so my plan to win is doing exactly what i'm doing right now COVID 19 has got everything on lock i don't know if this thing is going to june may august people aren't gathering um people aren't necessarily spending money cities are hurting right the county serving the sales tax has just gone down people aren't out like they used to be um you can help me by getting my message out you can help me by and not just not just listening to what i'm saying about him look at the media person And don't vote because you still here? I'm still there. I'm, I'm pretty sure you got a I lag do. too. So I'm on Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, uh, um, and Twitter. Uh, look me up, send me a message. I try to respond like the social media is wow. I still work full time, so I got to go to work too. But um, just support me. I mean, just get my message out there. You know, if you have a question, if you know somebody that has a question about what it is that I plan to do, why do they care? Why should they vote? Local politics is really the big game in town. I know the presidential race is coming up and that's all the excitement. But local politics, your local politician really is the big game in town because that really determines your quality of life more so almost than any president. Right. Criminal justice reform. I'm big on that. What does that mean? That means a lot. That means being an advocate for bail reform. That means not arresting people for misdemeanor possession of marijuana when there's other priority offenses. And right now, I'll just put it to you like this. There's only about between maybe seven to eight hundred empty beds in Tarrant County. Right. And the penitentiaries. I already said they're not taking inmates from Tarrant County. So like taking inmates, mm. something's going to happen, right? You're going to run out of jail space. So ideally, you want to prioritize public safety and have the people that are in jail that need to be there. Nonviolent offenses. I think Tarrant County said between six, right? Well, that's not happening right now. So where are those people going? They're staying at Tarrant County on top of everybody else that's coming in. Not a good practice. Or working your people. You know, you're over budget. Why? Too many people in jail that don't need to be there. So. Hmm. Good stuff. Well, I want to thank you for uh, just sharing about your platform. Uh, his website is vanskeys.com and he is on all social media platforms and he is available to answer all of your questions and he's seeking your vote in November uh, for yeah. Tarrant County Sheriff. Um, our website is workingfamiliesparty.org. I'm Candace Quarles. Like he said, um, I'm an advocate for local. Um, um, getting involved in local politics, this is the one that touches you every day. The, 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 the presidential pol policies will touch you statewide, but definitely everything we do in your backyard affects you um, quicker, sooner, and you feel the impact um, because of some local county politician. So I would advocate for people to get involved in local politics. Um, he, um, Vance Keys is running for sheriff and I want to thank you guys for this opportunity. You have a good one.